He was also named one of Newsweek's New Thought Leaders and one of the 25 smartest people of the decade by the Daily Beast. In 2012, GQ ranked him the third most powerful person in Washington. In 2014, he left his job as senior advisor to the president to join Uber, applying his gifts for strategic and innovative thinking to become senior vice president of policy and strategy. Today, he sits as chief advisor of the disruptive ride-sharing company and sits on its board of directors. Ladies and gentlemen, the senior advisor of Uber, Mr. David Bluff. Well, good morning, everyone. It's, it's great to be here at the SME Summit and here in Manila. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the sharing economy. I think there's a question uh, we see in the United States and around the world. People are asking, is the sharing economy a problem that needs to be managed or an opportunity that needs to be seized? And now I'm going to speak a lot about Uber because obviously we have insights into their data in terms of the marketplace that we're seeing. But I think a lot of my observations, in my view anyway, would also be relevant for other sharing economy companies. So what's fascinating about this question is if you think about where we were five years ago. So there's Uber 2010. Uber had just started. Many of the sharing economy companies were not even started yet. They were just an idea. So there's a blue dot. It's hard to see. But the only place we operated was in San Francisco. And the founders of Uber, uh, they didn't have any grand ambition. They just thought maybe we can make it easier for our friends to get a ride. For those of you that haven't used Uber, it's an app. You press a button and a car shows up in three, four, or five minutes and takes you where you're going to go. So seamless and uh, gives you really peace of mind in transportation. Now, just five years later, uh, Uber is in over 64 countries in over 360 cities. Uh, what's fascinating about being here in the Philippines, and I'm so excited to be here for a lot of reasons, but one is the Philippines were the very first country in the entire world to pass new regulations embracing ride sharing. And the Philippines leadership here is being recognized all over the world. So when we talk to governments all over the world, they want to ask, how did the Philippines move forward? Why did they do it? And I think the reason that Secretary Abaya and his team moved forward is they understood the benefits. So that's how many cities and countries we're in. So if you look at, um, when you think about Uber, and this again would go for a lot of different companies, what are the words you think about? Well, maybe app, car, taxi, technology, disruptive, aggressive. Some might even use stronger terms to describe us. But I think a lot of times the focus isn't on what happens when the sharing economy really begins to scale, when the marketplace becomes revealed. And there's a lot of positive benefits that come from that. And it's important for me to state that the company wasn't started, again, with grand ambition. And we are a business. We're not a nonprofit. But I'm going to talk about some of the benefits that we see. So here's Manila. All of you familiar with this? I spent quite a time, uh, amount of time in this traffic this morning. So not to pick on Manila, this is the case in most cities around the world. We have epic congestion. We all spend the equivalent of two days of our lives every year stuck in traffic. The productivity loss from that is epic. 20% of the emissions that harm our planet and contribute to climate change come from the emissions from cars. So, and it's only going to get worse. Young people in particular want to live in cities at a rate we've never seen before. So they're coming in epic numbers. Most cities don't have the ability to build huge new public transportation lines, even to add new freeways or roads. So something has to give. We have to see people change their behavior around transportation if we are going to make scenes like this become uh, more tolerable. So one thing we're really excited about at Uber, and some of our competitors are also doing products like this, uh, is something called Uber Pool. I apologize. Everything is Uber something, right? Uber X, Uber Black, Uber Pool. So we started talking about carpooling on scale as a global community in 1973 during the first OPEC oil crisis. So this is something every city planner, 
transportation planner is focused on. If we could get more people sharing rides and less people driving themselves, the average car in the world, for every car, there's 1.2 people in it. So almost every trip is somebody sitting alone. How could we change that? So the concept behind Uberpool is rather than me ordering an Uber, getting in the back seat of the car, and going to my destination alone, I can choose to share the ride. So if someone else is going in roughly the same destination, and this is important because it can't be inconvenient for people, it's still got to be a great consumer experience, we can opt to share the ride together. That means the ride is less expensive, which means Uber and car sharing becomes more available to more people, including lower income people. But it also means we're going to change behavior and you're going to have less congestion, less emissions as people change this. Now, we didn't know if this would work. We now have this in several Chinese cities, in Bangalore, in Paris, and in several US cities. And we're anxious to bring it to Manila when we can. But almost 50% of the people who use Uber in our home city of San Francisco carpool. 30% of the people in Los Angeles who use Uber, so that's 700,000 unique people in Los Angeles carpool. You're beginning to see behavior change. Connected to that is people giving up personal car ownership and usage. So that's the other side of the equation here. How can we get people to use their car less or ideally never buy one in the first place if they live in a city? So in the United States, which are most mature markets, 10% of people under 30 have given up a car already. They've decided. Now, some of them are using Uber and our competitor as the main way they get around, but most aren't. They're using subways, they're still using taxis, they're biking, they're using us. It becomes part of the ecosystem. So if we think about how are we going to reduce traffic jams and congestion and emission? In the next 15 to 20 years, the only answer on scale is having more people carpooling. The other benefit that we see in, on our platform, and this is true with all of our competitors too, is safety. So this chart shows um, bar closing times and when demand for Uber peaks in Amsterdam, in Brussels, Copenhagen, Paris, Warsaw. It's true here in Manila, it's true in New York City, it's true all over the world. And so there are places now that are reporting DUI arrests down 25, 30, 40 percent in just a year or two. Think about all the lives that are saved. And this is another place where we're seeing behavior change. Young people, if they live in a city where ride sharing is available, they don't even think about getting in a car if they're gonna have anything to drink or if their friend is. They wouldn't even think about it. Because why would you when you can press a button, have a car show up in three minutes and take you home? So this goes for distracted driving too. We talked to so many parents of people in college and high school and they'd far prefer their child to be in the back seat texting than in the front seat texting while they're driving. So this is huge change in terms of safety. But I really want to talk to you today about the economy. So uh, around the sharing economy, around platforms like Uber, there's still a lot of regulatory questions. Now, not so much in the Philippines because the Philippines has now decided to embrace ride sharing. But we're seeing the debate now move beyond the core regulatory question of, well, how does a service like Uber fit in with taxi? Uh, should it be embraced or not, to, okay, I think people think that ultimately this is going to be an eventuality, but is it good for the economy? How does it fit into the so-called debate about the future of work? So here is the unemployment rate. Now, I'm, I'm just going to talk about the United States, but this is similar in most places around the world. So obviously, in 2008 and 2009, we had a global recession. In the United States, it was the second worst economic event in our country's history. I ran President Obama's 2008 campaign when he became president and took the oath of office, the unemployment rate was 10%. Miraculously, it's gone down to five. That's good. But what hasn't really changed, and this is true in Manila, it's even true in China with their growth, it's true in Russia, it's true in Australia, it's true in the United States and all throughout Europe. Wages are stagnant. So people feel more secure with their job. They say, I don't fear that I'm gonna lose my job tomorrow, but I'm not making enough money. And real family income has declined. So. You know, I've probably consumed as much political research over the last 10 years as anyone on the planet, which is kind of a sad thing. But good political research and good business research is not about politics or about business. It's about how people are living their lives and really understanding their hopes, their aspirations, their challenges. And when you talk to people about, around the world about their lives, universally and almost unequivocally, they have two observations. 
They say, I don't have enough time, and I don't have enough money. And those two things are very closely connected. And that's where platforms like ours come in. So on scale, as of today, we have over a million active drivers. Think about that. The company did not exist five years ago. Over 80% of those are in APAC economy. So I think it's important to understand a lot of times when you, when you hear commentary about the sharing economy, where it's Uber, another company, there's a sense that these are kind of niche services. They're used by the tech forward, people in this crowd, but maybe the rest of the population doesn't quite understand it. But what you're seeing is on scale. So in the United States, there's 400,000 drivers. 400,000 people getting income. There's nothing else like it in our private sector over the last two years that's created that kind of economic activity. It's important also to understand how people are using the platforms. Oftentimes, the debate around Uber, and again, I'm going to talk a lot about Uber because that's what I have access to, okay? But this goes for all the other platforms. But in our case, and this is true for Grab Taxi here as well, people look at the debate very narrowly as if, okay, we have a taxi market. And there's this many people taking taxi trips and this many people who are taxi drivers. So the sharing economy, platforms like Uber now, are, there's going to be a competition for that market. We're not interested in that debate at all. That's not what's going on. The market for people who are using for hire vehicle transportation is exploding all over the world. It turns out there's a lot more people than anyone realized looking for a different way to get around their city. And it turns out there's a lot more people than anybody realized who are willing to drive them around the city. Driving is something pretty much all of us can do. Yet the old regulatory system basically prevented that opportunity for people. It also forced people into car ownership because there weren't enough taxis and other vehicles around to give you the opportunity not to own a car or two. So the way people are using these platforms is not as they have decided, in our case, to become an Uber driver partner for the rest of their life. They're doing it for a period of time that works for them. It could be three years, it could be three months. In some cases, we even see around the holidays, people drive on the platform to make money to pay for all their holiday expenses. And then they go, then they don't, they stop driving. The power of that cannot be overstated. They decide when to work or not. But less, half of our drivers drive less than 10 hours a week. In this region, it's 47%. In China, it's almost 70%. So the way people are using these platforms is, to say, I have a job and an income. My spouse may too. We're not satisfied with our income. So what I'm gonna do is go from here to here, but I'm gonna decide when to do it because we don't have any scheduling. There's a big debate around the world, certainly in the United States around on-call scheduling, that people are feeling they do not have enough notice for when they're gonna work if they're only getting two or three days notice. Well, with our platform, there's no schedule at all. You decide when to work, or not at all. Four hours today, eight hours today, not at all next week. The power of that can't be understated because as much as people say they don't have enough time and money, the other thing they say is, I don't have enough control of either. So when you give people the power to create more income in a way that they fit around taking care of their kids, their parents, their schoolwork, their training, their social desires and obligations, it's a very powerful thing. So when you think about these platforms, this is not a mass substitution of people doing something full time. It is people who are using this to augment income. One of the other benefits we see, and I think this is another reason that Secretary Abaya uh, and his team embraced Uber was, this is not about um, you know, competing where taxis are strong. Okay, I work for Uber, so when I'm in major cities, like I was in New York last week, I took a yellow taxi because it's easier to get out of an office building sometimes and still hail a cab, something you can't do on Uber, than press a button and wait five minutes, okay? But where our value proposition is, is where transportation has been too hard. And this accounts in two ways. One, when researchers look at people in poverty and they examine the core reasons that they say strapped in poverty or have difficulty reaching their ambition. Education is a big part of the problem. Surprisingly, so is transportation. The inaccessibility of transportation and the cost of it. So if someone has to, it takes them an hour and a half or two hours to walk to a subway line, they take that in, they take a cab, it's hard, it costs too much money. So what you're seeing on Uber, now this is New York, uh, so sorry for a US example, but the sort of orange is Manhattan, which is the financial district, the Empire State Building, uh, the former Twin Towers, 
And we have good business there, but 95% of taxi trips happen in Manhattan, so it's pretty well supplied. The purple is all the rest of New York. Places where there's hardly any taxis, and your only option really was to own a car or walk a long way unless you were right next to a subway stop. So when you think about these sharing economy companies like ours, we're filling gaps. Most people didn't realize, I think, till the last few years, how many transportation deserts there were around the world. Where basically, it was too hard to get around. You were basically stuck there. You were forced into car ownership. And what is the biggest financial burden on low-income people? Vehicle ownership. It takes so much of their income. And it's something that we use, our cars are used, 4% of the day. They just sit idle. 15% of the city real estate around the world is parking. And think about that. Many of those parking lots are empty at night. They're deserted on the weekend. If we can have more people getting around without personal car ownership, you might be able to reclaim some of that time. So this is Chicago, where I put this up here because this is President Obama's hometown. Over half our trips in Chicago begin in underserved areas. And this is true in Manila. It's true in Chengdu, China. You see that basically the demand is there. And the power of this, the, there has been an inequality in transportation for as long as we've been doing transportation. Not anymore. You press a button in a poor part of a city or a suburban part of the city, and a driver comes in three to five minutes. You do that in a wealthy part of the city where it's always been easy to get around, it's three to five minutes. So yes, there's a big financial and time element to this, but there's also a powerful emotion that comes with that, which is for the first time in people's lives, they have the same transportation as everybody else in the rest of the city did. So when you talk to our driver partners about why they drive on the platform, and again, I think you would find this consistent with other sharing economy platforms, 87% is to be my own boss and set my own schedule. 73% actually say that I'd rather have a job where they choose their own schedule than a steady one with a set salary. I'll tell you a big use case for Uber is people who have lost their job or had their hours cut. So they lose their job, they come drive on our platform. Of course, they can do job interviews whenever they want because they don't have to ask their boss whether they can go do it. They just turn off the app and go do the job interview. And they drive for us until they find what's next. We have a huge number around the globe, almost 50,000 in the US alone, former military members. They come out of the service. They're not sure what's next. So they drive on our platform until they figure that out. The other thing that surprised me, I figured most drivers on Uber were driving for a certain amount of money each week or each month. And plenty do. But most of them don't. Most of them are driving for a goal. It could be aspirational. Like, this is how I'm going to pay for my vacation or flying my parents in. Or my child's going to college, I want to buy him a new laptop. So rather than eating into my savings, I'll drive on Uber until I get the money. Or it can be when they get in a dire circumstance. An appliance breaks. They have an unexpected health care bill. In the United States, the most important economic statistic in our country today, and this is true around the world, but in the US, 47% of the people in our country say if they get a $400 bill they weren't expected, they can't deal with it. Think about that. They have to go into debt. They are living on the edge because their incomes haven't gotten. 65% of our drivers vary their schedule week to week by more than 25%. They don't even have their own schedule. They're making it up as they go along. Think about that. You never have to say, well, this Thursday I'm working four to eight. You just say, I'm gonna wait and see what happens in my life when I get off work, or am I gonna have dinner with my friends, or what my kid's homework situation is, and if I have a couple hours, I'll go drive and make a little bit of money. So it's a very powerful feeling for people. So, you know, obviously income's important. 91% of our drivers drive to earn more income to better support themselves or our family. Interestingly, around the world, over 50% of our drivers have young kids at home. So they're facing that challenge of not having enough money to provide for their children. 33% though just drive to make a little extra spending money. So this isn't all people in dire circumstances. Some people are using this more aspirationally to say, here's how I'm gonna pay for dinner or movies or travel. And I, again, because my, my core job's not paying what I'd like, I don't have to borrow money or put that on my credit card. I'm gonna use what I make on the Uber platform to support myself. And I think this is why so many people around the world now are starting to embrace uh, 
ride sharing. So this is a map of, in the United States, we've had over 70 new laws passed. The Philippines, the first country to do so. The capital of Australia just did two weeks ago. Lithuania, many states in India. Mexico City, the largest city on the planet to embrace ride sharing. And the reason this is happening, and your leadership here in the Philippines saw this, was if the debate's just narrow about how do platforms like ours compete with an existing industry within that small pie, and how do you fit us into old regulations, that's never going to be a satisfying conversation. But if you have your eyes fixed on the horizon and say, we need more money for more of our people, we need to think about how do we reduce congestion, we have to make transportation safer, all these are the goals. And so that's what we see in the sharing economy. And there's a lot of valid questions. Are we going to have most of the population freelancing? Probably not. But is there more people going to be doing it in 10 years? How does that affect questions around things like benefits? Although all those are valid questions. But I humbly suggest to you that the sharing economy platforms like ours are not a problem that needs to be managed. It's an opportunity that needs to be seized. And then we figure out how to build on it. So here I'll end with this. This is uh, your great secretary of transportation. Uh, Mr. Abaya, with our general manager in the Philippines, Lawrence, holding the first nationwide ride-sharing regulations in the world. And so we're so happy to be here because what Manila has done, what the Philippines have done, has resonated around the world. And I think giving a better understanding of some of these platforms, right? This, this isn't about, wow, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that have been doing something for some time, and now they're going to have most of their marketplace disaggregated. That's not what's happening. The truth is, for all of us who are enabling transportation, we're a tech company that provides that on the ground, there's opportunity. Because if more people decide not to buy cars, if more people decide to leave their car at home, then anybody that's involved in moving people around, whether it's public transportation, taxis, pedicabs, right, platforms like Uber, are going to benefit from that. And the key thing we look at it from a reliability standpoint is we want to make sure that that rides there in three minutes because you will not give up your car if there's ever uncertainty about whether the car will be there. So our standard is we want to make Uber here in Manila and elsewhere as quick and as easy as going to picking up your keys, walking outside, and starting your car. And if you do that, you'll give people confidence that they can engage in that behavior change and reduce car ownership. So thanks for your time. With that, I'd love to jump into any questions or comments you guys have. Uh, you know, I'm even willing to take a question about Donald Trump and that all nonsense, but uh, whatever you guys want to talk about. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Tyler from Canada, and I live in Manila, and I'm an Uber user. Thank I you, sir. I really love the service. Thank you. Uh, but my question, you, your, your talk focused uh, a lot on the economic benefit of drivers. Um, but there's a lot of talk about self-driving cars coming to the market right. and how is, how is self-driving automobiles going to affect that market? Right, right. Well, listen, I think that um, the latest numbers show 1.2 million people a year die in car crashes. Many of them are young people. So think about that. That's as many people as die from breast cancer every year. That's twice the number of people who died on the beaches of Normandy during D-Day, during World War II. So if you could get to a point where you didn't have any accidents, and you had no death, so there's public health. That transportation probably is a lot safer, a lot more inexpensive, and could help with congestion. So, but this is not, and, and we obviously are investing in technology. I think there'll be a lot of near-term gains as we have better collision detection. The cars are going to get smarter. The maps will get better. The phones get smarter. But this isn't a decision for Uber or Google or Hyundai or Mercedes. I mean, the world's going to decide when the technology's ready and where they're ready from a regulatory standpoint. My suspicion is the world won't decide that in unison. Some places may embrace it more quickly than others, but it's a long way off. I think it's going to happen, and I think it's exciting when it does, but think about the regulatory issues. Right now, you know, it's, th these cars are doing pretty well in good climates, but you know, rain and snow, and they have to be perfect. And then you obviously then have to have regulatory certainty. So, our suspicion is what we're going to be worried about next year, the year after that, five years from now, seven years, ten years from now, is our core business will be people behind the wheel driving people somewhere. And when autonomous vehicles are embraced places, it will probably be more of a transition thing where they'll slowly be integrated, but, and, you know, maybe, you know, they'll be on platforms like ours, but the core proposition will still be driving. So 
you know, and this is not a question we hear a lot from our driver partners, because again, most of them aren't making a career decision. They're doing this for a period of time. Some may be doing it for five or 10 years, but for most people, it's a far, far enough horizon. So I think, you know, this is a broader question for, you know, there's a lot of parts of our economies that there's some strong suspicion there'll be disruption from automation and artificial intelligence and other developments, even virtual reality. So we as, you know, when I used to live in government, work in government, I think one of the real things governments humbly don't do enough of, and I clearly am criticizing myself here too, is we don't plan out long enough, okay? We don't really think through how are things changing. So even around Uber, there aren't a lot of discussions that say, wow, if there's this many people now who are gonna choose something like this platform and our competitors get around, and those trends continue, there's gonna be less personal car usage, less personal car ownership. What does that mean in terms of investments in roads and bridges? Could we look to maybe modify that a little bit? So I think there's not enough long range planning. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, I have a 10 year old, are they gonna have to get a license? Yes, almost certainly. Maybe everyone born today is still gonna have to get a license to drive. So I, I you know, that, that future is coming, right? It's clear and basically every tech company, every auto manufacturer is investing a lot in this. Governments are starting to invest in this. And so it's an exciting future, but it's a ways off when you're gonna get full scale adoption. Plus just the production challenges are enormous to produce that many vehicles to replace the vehicles we have on the road. Yes, sir. Speed Ramtran from the United States. Question for you, does Uber have currently a program or would you consider a program, corporate partnership so that I could provide your rides for my employees? Yes, sir. Uh, it's called Uber for Business, and I'll make sure that uh, someone from our, from our companies here talks to you. Yeah, it's one of our fastest growing product lines. Because what we found is so many people use Uber in their personal life. So we started to get a lot of HR departments say, how can we provide this as an opportunity for our employees? So yes, it's one of our fastest growing product lines. We have tens of thousands of business around the world now that have Uber for Business. And obviously, there's no paper receipts uh, it tends to be less expensive transportation, and it's a good service. So for, from, a, from a business standpoint, you're saving money. It's a digital transmission of all those expenses. Uh, and so it works really well. So we'll be in touch with you on that. It's, it's really exciting. We're also beginning to work with governments, like the US government now, our Congress, you can use Uber and our competitor Lyft, and that's a reimbursable expense. So part of this is just the challenge of it, like people have to get their head around it, but what we've seen is business leaders have gotten it very early on. Uh, and this is a place of, of great um, promise for us. And it's also gonna save, I think, businesses a lot of money. Yes, sir. Well, we should do some gender diversity here. Let's do a uh, female question. What do we have? Okay, there we go, back there. Oh, and I'm told this is our last question. So make it a good one. Yeah. What's that? Oh, you took notes? I'm Samantha from the Philippines, and I've been using Uber for like the past months, and well, I love you. it. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I guess um, this is really a question for you, Mr. Pluff. Um, I am curious to know how much of your efforts have been to work with the government uh, to help Uber grow at this scale and deal with maybe outdated um, regulations and policies, and. Um, what would your advice be to SMEs who are trying to disrupt um, industries that would have implications, I guess, in right. like maybe outdated regulations and policies? It's a great question. I mean, I think first of all, when I worked in the White House with President Obama, he ordered the first top to bottom review of every federal like regulation on the books in decades. Think about that, in decades. So what happens a lot is these regular, and I'm someone who believes very passionately in smart regulations around protecting of health, safety. But I think if you believe in regulations, you should be the first one to raise your hand when there are regulations that don't make sense or have outserved their usefulness. Otherwise, you don't have credibility. And what happens is regulations get on the book. So just talking about transportation, then I'll get to broader. So many transportation regulations had been passed 40 or 50 years ago before GPS, cell phone technology, and they had never been reviewed. So I think one challenge for government, it's hard. You know, everyone's a critic of government and you have too little time, you're dealing with crisis, it's really hard. But I think with the pace of technological change, governments, national and local, 
are going to have to find a way with more frequency to evaluate what they have on the books and to say, is this fit for a purpose right now? Does it need to be scrapped? Does it need to be changed? That doesn't happen enough. So before Uber came around, that discussion wasn't happening. We, in many ways, forced it, right? So I think one of the challenges is, I think, and we're trying to get better as a company, is you have to understand where the other person's coming from. I would argue this is true in marriage or business relationship or in government. You just can't look at the world through your own eyes. And so part of what you have to do is understand, well, what is, what is the government focused on? If it's reduction of drunk driving or if it's trying to get more income opportunity for women or if it's trying to deal with congestion, then to understand that this isn't a question in our case about you know, whether we can operate the way we want to, but what's, what we can do is work together on these issues. So if you provide a pathway of certainty, then we can really work on this. So I think any of you out there have to understand what's the value proposition for government? And is it tangible? Is it something that can scale? But I do think this is a challenge for all of you that are bringing new innovation, is that you have a, for the most part, a regulatory situation with a lot of governments where laws get passed, regulations get passed, and they almost get put away, and they don't get revisited unless there's kind of a crisis. In our case, we forced a reevaluation in a lot of those regulations. So what Secretary Abai has done here and others around the world is they didn't try and jam us into existing regulations. That won't ever work. What they did was, let's craft new regulations that provide certainty around safety, around insurance, but allow this opportunity. So I think that's one of the challenges, but I would think that you just can't go in and say, hey, we have a great idea, and you know this is going to be a profitable business. To the extent you can, also say, how, does, how do what we want to do, how does that match up with the priorities of the government? And how can we tell a story and not just a story, back it up with good facts and data that says we are going to be a positive net contributor to what you're trying to do in this city. So again, that's from our standpoint, we have to broaden out the debate because when you talk about, oh, now we just have to divvy up the existing taxi jobs, that's a tougher debate than saying, we're going to grow the whole pie and create a lot of economic opportunity for a lot of people. That's a completely different question. And the other thing I say is just have sympathy because you know governments you know, they don't have as many resources as a lot of the private sector do. You know, they don't move necessarily as quickly and sometimes for very good reason. But also try and just really develop a relationships there of trust and mutual understanding that, yes, you're a business, you're trying to be profitable, you're not a nonprofit, okay? But there's good benefits that are coming out of what you're trying to do. So thank you everybody for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. David Pluff.